we come as representatives of our community to offer our work to the service of God. We welcome you in the name of the one who made us all, people, animals, and all the earth. On behalf of my chapter colleagues, may I, as Dean, welcome you all to Chester Cathedral. Uh, you gather as members of the farming community and as representatives of rural life in Cheshire. You live close to the land and care for it, nurturing growth, feeding our nation supporting our economy. You form a bridge between the economy of God and the material economy on which we depend, working with the very stuff of life. Today we come together to pray to the God of heaven and earth for fruitfulness and to pray that we may be responsible stewards 
of the good earth entrusted to us. It is good that we can gather in this way and in this place with a plough in front of us, with some of the soil of the land, and ask the God of the earth and everything in it to feed our spirits, instruct us, and teach us the right way to be. Welcome to the plough service. The earth is the Lord's. The wide extent of the world. The Lord looked upon the earth. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest. When farmers plough for planting, do they plough continually? When they have levelled the surface, do they not plant wheat in its place and barley in its plot? And so we make our confession to Almighty God. When we are ungrateful for the rain, sun and frost, and forget they are God's gift to us. O oh God, forgive us. When we are blind to the mystery of germination and forget it, it is God's handiwork. O oh God, forgive us. When we are careless with our beasts and forget they are God's creatures. O oh God, forgive us. When we are unkind to those who work with us, and forget they are God's children. O oh God, forgive us. When we are careless about our work, and forget we are God's co-workers. O oh God, forgive us. When we, we ill-treat the land, and forget we are God's stewards. O oh God, forgive us. May God, the Creator, forgive our misusing of his creative work. May God, the Son, take up into his cross the sufferings of our land, our animals, our families and ourselves. May God, the Holy Spirit, give us the strength and power to overcome our troubles, weaknesses and temptations. May God, the Holy Trinity, forgive us all our sins. Amen. This reading is from Ecclesiastes, chapter 28, verse 25 to 38. How can the plowman become wise, whose sole ambition is to wield the goad, driving his oxen, engrossed in their work, his, conservation, his conversation limited to bullocks, his thoughts observed in the furrows he traces, and the long evenings spent in fattening heifers? Similarly, with all workmen and craftsmen, toiling day and night, those who engrave seals, forever trying to think of a new design, concentrating on catching a good likeness and staying up late to get their work done. Similarly, with the blacksmith sitting by his anvil, he considers what to do with the pig iron. The breath of the fire scorches his skin as he contends with the heat in the furnace. The noise of the hammer deafens him. His eyes are fixed on the pattern. He concentrates on getting the job done well and stays up late to apply the finishing touches. Similarly with the potter, sitting at his work, turning the wheel with his feet, constantly on the alert over his work, each flick of the finger premeditated. He pummels the clay with his arm, and with his feet he needs it. 
He concentrates on applying the glaze right and stays up late to clean the kiln. All these people rely on their hands and each is skilled at his own craft. A town could not be inhabited without them. There would be no settling, no travelling. But you will not find them in the parliament. They do not hold high rank in the assembly. They do not sit on the judicial bench and they do not mediate on the law. They're not remarkable for their culture or judgment, nor are they found frequenting the philosophers. They sustain the structure of the world and their prayer is concerned with their trade. The second reading is taken from the Gospel according to St Matthew, chapter 6, beginning to read at the 25th verse. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, or reap, or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And you are much more value than they. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendour was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, Will he not much clothe you of little faith? Do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own.
may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, it's a very great pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much to Chester for inviting me to be part of this plough service. Uh, I run the Arthur Rank Centre, who, which has its 50th birthday next year. Uh, we were born out of providing chaplaincy services to the Royal Agricultural Society of England uh, down at what used to be the National Agricultural Centre. And these days, our vision is of confident rural Christians, because we think confident Christians in rural places helps make rural places better. And uh, we do that by uh, offering resources for church communities, by offering training to lay and ordain church leaders, and by advocating into the church structures and denominations and into government as well. And we're a proudly ecumenical organization. And when I mentioned the other day, um, we're still on Zoom at the moment, we're, we're about to go back into the office, but I mentioned on the coffee Zoom that uh, I was preaching at a plough service today. Someone went, well, that's weird timing. Everyone else is on harvest. And indeed, I have done a harvest service this morning. Um, and then they paused actually and said, but I suppose actually winter planting, it kind of makes sense. And it does kind of make sense. So congratulations, Cathedral, on landing on a very sensible time of year for a plough service. Um, a quick check then of who we've got. If you're professionally involved in getting food onto my table to eat, please can you wave? Lovely, thank you. If you have a patch of garden which you tend and you, okay, you get to eat some of it yourself and you occasionally actually hand some on to other people, could you please wave? Okay, not bad. If you eat food, could you please wave? That's quite promising. Good. Well, whatever the timing, whatever it is that you bring to this service, whether it's a professional, a, a leisure, or indeed uh, just a very satisfied feeling um, of set of skills, you people who plough and sow and ten crops, other people who feed me, and I am grateful to you for your hard work through the year. I am not actually a farmer myself, um, although my granddad was a farm worker, and here I'm going to reveal how decrepit the farm that I used to help on in the 1970s was. I know how to plant potatoes to the sound of a bell. Does that mean anything to anybody? Oh, we've got a few nods. Yeah, yeah, you can explain it to the youngsters afterwards. And I know that I can't scatter seed when I plant as consistently as my grandfather did, um, could. He used to claim that when he was in practice, three corns to the thumb. Now that is going back, that's sowing by hand. He would claim it was precision and was one of the first to take the steam plough from farm to farm in Shropshire. But he'd have been fascinated by farming today by the fact we don't necessarily plough the fields, we certainly don't scatter, we do things precisely. And the craft and skill of farming was celebrated in the first reading that we heard this afternoon. There's a sense in that reading of the commitment and concentration when people are engaged in their craft. And the writer talks about ploughing, smiths, potters, and acknowledges their enormous contribution to the society that he lived in, probably two and a half or so thousand years ago. A town, he says, could not be inhabited without them. And the writer is describing the division of labor that he could see around him as the world moved away from subsistence farming and took a technological leap into a pattern where different people became skilled in different crafts and production. He added, uh, they sustain the structure of the world. And I think that should be said of everyone involved in food produ production of today as well. But listening to that reading, you may have taken exception, perhaps, to the, some of the things that were said. The idea that farmers won't be found in 
Parliament, holding high rank or sitting on a bench as a magistrate. But remember, the writer was describing society that he lived in and he observed a couple of hundred or five, even as many as 500 years before Jesus was born. So he was talking about a slightly different world. But he was rejoicing in the many ways that people worked together for the common good. Well, today we might divide that work a little bit differently, but we can still appreciate the contributions that everybody makes to the functioning of their community. And it's an idea that gets picked up a lot in the New Testament, uh, reminding us that we all have different skills and different gifts. But our New Testament reading, that second reading from Matthew's Gospel, I think contrasts quite oddly with the Old Testament praise of those skills and concentration and hard work. Instead, Matthew reports the voice of Jesus saying, oh, don't worry about your life, about what you will eat or what you will drink. That's a strange thing for us to hear, especially in a week where universal credit has been cut, the furlough scheme has ended and energy prices for people on prepayment meters are rising. I've heard too many discussions about the choices people will make between fuel, food, and heat, and about food banks preparing for a rise in demand. And we know only too well that the farming community is not immune to these things and these pressures. Obviously, people are worrying about what they will eat Producing food is hard work. What is Jesus on about? I'm going to take a small digression now, just because we are talking about one of my favorite passages and there's a bit in it I'd like to tell you about, just so you know. There's that verse, can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Has anybody ever managed that? You know, have a really good worry and know you'll live at least till lunchtime longer. No, I didn't think so. But actually, there's a different translation of it if you go back to the Greek. And that, that's even more graphic. Can any of you, by worrying, add one cubit to your height? Cubit length from your elbow to the tip of your middle finger. Uh, so a bit variable, but has anyone ever managed to grow taller by worrying? There's a few of us out here who would love to know. Does it work? Yes, Claire, no Claire, no Claire. So it seems that Jesus is perhaps telling us not to worry rather than not to do something. And I think that's reinforced by the example, he says, consider the lilies of the field, the flowers of the field, how they grow. They don't work. And yet King Solomon in his, all his glory was not clothed like one of these. So Jesus is telling us something different. He's telling us not to worry ourselves into being taller or having a longer life, but to strive for the kingdom of God and to do things of which God will approve. It doesn't absolve us of responsibility. It, it isn't that kind of, oh, don't worry about it, just let it all drift by. It's not like that. We still need to look after our plants, our animals, and grow food, and use those skills which God has given us to, for the good of our community. But we can do these things as part of our own looking for the kingdom of God, that kingdom that is shown so clearly by God's love. Because if we love God, we will care for God's creation. If we love our neighbor, we will help them to eat and to live and to thrive. And if we love ourselves, we might even be less anxious and look after ourselves as well. Lilies of the field don't work, but they are very, very good at being beautiful. We've got beautiful flowers there. They're very good at being beautiful. 
They're not much good at much else, but they're brilliant at being beautiful. The birds of the air do exactly what they need to survive, to survive, but they are very, very good at being birds. I am notoriously useless at being the Reverend Anne Lawson, or indeed any of the other people here present, but I am the best person I know at being Claire. I am very, very good at being me. And perhaps we need to remind ourselves that each of us is precious for who we are. We each bear an image or an imprint of God. And the more our, ourselves we can be, the more we love and seek for God's kingdom, the more others are able to see God at work in us. And God loves us so much as we are. God loves each of you for who you are. Not for who you might be one day, not for who you were back in the day, but for who you are now. God loves you. Plowing and sowing today is a precision, controlled kind of task. Is that fair? Yeah. But letting God's love surround us, enfold us, and transform us into our true selves feels almost like the opposite. If we can allow that have to happen, that wildness, if we can allow God to love us unconditionally, me and you, just as God wants to, then we will, whether we want to or not, sow that love unconditionally everywhere we go for others to reap in abundance. So God bless you for the seeds that you sow with skill and precision. And can I encourage you to go and sow seeds of love and be profligate and reckless with them. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Firstly, apologies to the choir for this, but I can't resist the temptation. And did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's mountains green? And was the holy Lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? You can take your hands off your ears now. Thank you. Obviously, these are the opening lines to the hymn Jerusalem, first written as a poem by William Blake and then added to music by composer Sir Hubert Parry in 1916 to raise morale following horrendous casualties in World War I and since adopted by the Women's Institute, heard at sporting events and used by all parties at their party conferences. The final line being, in England's green and pleasant land. In England's green and pleasant land reminded soldiers that back home there was a country worth fighting for. A country whose farmers, once seen as peasants, now farmed, working with nature to provide food for them and their families back home. A country to be proud of. This was, and still is, the case. But where was it our population turned when restrictions allowed during the coronavirus pandemic? The countryside. With family groups or bubbles walking its plentiful footpaths or cycling along its country lanes, even perhaps staying in and watching an episode of Escape to the Country for the twelfth time. And it's that word, escape, that suggests the element of freedom and open spaces often enjoyed by the British public visiting our beautiful landscape with its woodland, hedges, rivers and streams being interwoven, being interwoven by a variety of crops home to different species and breed of animals living alongside our natural wildlife. This joyous scene hasn't happened by accident. It, happened, it hasn't happened despite agriculture. It's happened because of agriculture. The farmers and their employees working with the environment and within the elements to feed our nation. In a recent survey, 75% of people voiced a positive view of UK farming. 89% of people feel farming is important to the UK economy, with 86% agreeing British farms should grow as much food as possible to provide national food security. Yet, if really pushed, many of our British public believe that agriculture is extremely damaging to our environment and ultimately our planet, saying livestock and dairy farming is one of the biggest sources of greenhouse gas emissions. This is simply not true. Yes, of course, agriculture releases carbon. Indeed, the very implement that brings us here today, the plough, could be viewed as one of the biggest culprits. But in fact, agriculture is only responsible for 10% of greenhouse gas emissions. The residential sector produces 15%. So the very people pointing the finger are 50% worse than those they accuse. Farming and rural Britain can provide solutions to the many challenges we face, from green growth and climate change mitigation to improving the health and well-being of our nation by the food we produce and the way we produce it. Therefore, agriculture should be viewed as a solution and not the problem. For many years now, we've been embracing developments in technology of machines we use on our farms to meet our net zero aspirations, ambitions, sorry, with targeted manure applications that prevent losses up into the atmosphere, meaning less reliance on artificial fertilizers. Minimum tillage implements that maintain excellent soil structures. Nutritional efficiencies in the way we feed our livestock. The list is endless. 
And I'd like to take this point to thank the government for supporting the farmers with future schemes to assist the purchasing of new equipment to help us down this route. But with the scaling back of basic pay payment scheme and the introduction of the Agricultural Transition Plan, I have grave concerns. Grave concerns about the future sustainability of British farming being traded off in favour of our nation's environmental aspirations. Also, we are world leaders regarding animal health and welfare, and the Red Tractor logo on food packaging is a guarantee of excellence in the way our food is produced. But this always comes with a cost and must be protected against cheaper substandard products within the world marketplace. Our nation, particularly in, in times of need, has always relied on the faithful dog called agriculture. Please look after us. Please listen to us, or one day we might not be there. Remember, once in your life, you might need an undertaker. Once a year, you might need a dentist. But no matter what your diet, three times a day, you need a farmer. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Katie Lowe and I run an organic dairy farm just outside Sandbach here in Cheshire. And I've been asked to talk to you a little bit about my personal experience of farming over the past few years. Just over seven years ago, I was enjoying a very different lifestyle, living and working in the hustle and bustle of central London. I loved everything about it, but I always knew it was short term and that my dream was to come home and farm with my dad. So in July 2014, that was exactly what I did. Sorry. Over the following summer, Dad and I began to make lots of plans, and I became a partner in the farm business with Mum and Dad on the 1st of October. Sadly, things weren't set to be quite so straightforward, as just three weeks later, Dad suddenly passed away. And at 24 years old, I found myself in charge of school farm with very little idea of what I was doing. Having never worked a full year on the farm previously, a lot of the things I did were trial and error, and Google very quickly became my best friend. We muddled through, and Mum and I never considered doing anything else other than to keep going at school farm. Mum and Dad had not made any huge investments into the farm for a number of years, having not been 100% sure there really was a successor. With me returning, though, we had started to plan a new cubicle shed with robotic milking machines in order to modernise and ensure the future of the business. After a few months on the back burner, in January 2015, we made the decision to plough on again and I started doing a lot of research into every type of rob robot, cubicle, slurry storage system under the sun, visiting a lot of farms across the country in the process. The last year of milking was a tough one, with the parlour slowly dilapidating and increasing interruption from the building work. Luckily, exactly six years ago today, I married James, who I had successfully taught how to do the milking. So, delegation was the name of the game in the evenings and weekends. And Mum was also always there to get the cows up. And even my 83-year-old granddad could be relied on to wash the parlour down. And, being the hero he was, appeared in the parlour most mornings at half past five with a hot drink for me. We began training the cows on the robots on the 23rd of September, and it was truly a family affair once again. With Mum, Grandad, James, my sister Sarah and I quite literally pushing cows through the robot at all hours of the day and night. We were exhausted, but this all paid off when the cows trotted happily into the robots for their first milking a few days later. The cows took to the robots like ducks to water, and after a couple of weeks of sleeping on a sofa in the shed, I left them to their own devices, and we've never looked back. With the cows happy and living in the lap of luxury, 
we've now turned our attentions to the young stock and have been slowly converting the old cubicle shed into much better accommodation for our calves, which will be ready for them to move into this winter. A good job, as we've once again been shut down with TB restrictions, so currently have a lot more young stock on our hands than normal. Aside from farming, we've also been busy with a few other projects this summer to bring some of the redundant old farm buildings back to life. In particular, we've converted one of our barns into a well-being and event space, as much as I love farming, it's been great to step out of my comfort zone and do something entirely different. We're now host to a plethora of classes on a weekly basis and have a myriad of retreats and workshops planned for the future. The past seven years have certainly thrown up a huge number of challenges and farming without dad was certainly never part of the plan. We still operate very much as a family farm in every sense and I'm very lucky to have such a great support system around me. My husband, James, works full time away from the farm, but is always ready to throw on a pair of wellies whenever he's asked. Mum is now retired and has a partner, John, who, luckily for me, as an ex-dairy farmer, has very quickly become my right-hand man. I really have no idea what I would do without them all, especially as I prepare to welcome my second child in just a few weeks' time. Growing up, the farm provided us with the most amazing childhood, the wonderful memories of all my family together at School Farm are something I cherish and really aspire to create for my children too. <laughs> Life has not been plain sailing in recent years, but the relentlessness of farming has at times been a blessing. Even on the coldest and darkest of days, Nothing pulls you out of bed in the morning, quite like knowing that 200 animals are relying on you to feed them. Through all its ups, downs, twists and turns, farming really is, for the most part, a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you. This plough symbolises all the machines on our farms and all the tools of the horticulturist. Will you pray God's blessing on this plough and on our cultivation of the soil? O oh God, our Father, giver of seed time and harvest, bless all ploughs, tractors and tools large and small, used in the work of our farms. May they be instruments of fruitfulness 
May all who use them do so to your glory and in the grateful and hopeful offering of their daily work for their own and others' good that your people may be fed and all rejoice in your bounty through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God, speed the plow. God, speed the plow. O oh Lord, we bring before you this soil, teeming with the life of tiny creatures, full of nutrients and goodness. Without soil, no life would exist upon the earth. By it, we are nourished, and to it, we will return. We give thanks to those who down the ages have studied plants and soil, giving us a better understanding. O oh, let the earth bless the Lord. We give thanks for the satisfaction of growing good crops, for feeding beasts and people. And let the earth bless the Lord. We give thanks for all growing things which provide us with remedies and medicines. O oh Lord, let the earth bless the Lord. We give thanks for all plants and trees which give us scent, colour and beauty. O oh, let the earth bless the Lord. O Creator God, maker of all that is, we offer you this soil. We praise and bless you for this marvellous and intricate creation. Help us to reverence and respect the humble soil as your means of feeding and providing for us. Bless this soil and all the soil around us, the soil in our fields and gardens, the soil on the hills and in the woodlands, so that the whole earth gives glory to you, Creator Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Creator God, you give us the amazing gift of soil in which to grow crops to feed both humans and animals. Grant us wisdom as we seek to work with you and in harmony with the microorganisms and worms in maintaining soil fertility and proper drainage. As we plant successive crops, we trust you for the miracle of growth enabled by the balance of light, warmth, nutrients, and moisture to produce an abundant crop. Keep us alert to maintain and use our farm machinery carefully and give us pride and satisfaction in our work. This we pray in the name of Christ, who set his hand to the plough and did not look back. Amen. When we are ungrateful for rain, sun and frost, and forget they are God's gift to us, O oh God, forgive us. When we are blind to the mystery of germination, and forget God's handiwork. O oh God, forgive us. 
when we are careless with our beasts and forget that they are God's creatures. O oh God, forgive us. When we are unkind to those who work with us and forget they are God's children. O oh God, forgive us. When we are careless about our work and forget we are God's co-workers. O oh God, forgive us. When we ill-treat the land and forget we are God's stewards. O oh God, forgive us. Every good and perfect gift comes from you, O oh Lord, for fertile soil, for the smell of newly turned earth. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, for keen, cold, frosty winter days and nights. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, for the tractor's hum and the gleam of a cutting edge. We give you thanks, O oh Lord for the beauty of a clean cut furrow and the sweep of a well ploughed field. We give you thanks, O Lord. Blessed be you, Lord, for all your gifts to us. Amen. Verses from John Macefield's The Everlasting Mercy. O Christ who holds the open gate, O Christ who drives the furrow straight, O Christ the plough, O Christ the laughter, of holy white birds flying after, lo, all my heart feels red and torn, and thou wilt bring the young green corn, young green corn divinely springing, young green corn forever singing. And when the field is fresh and fair, thy blessed feet shall glitter there. And we will walk the weeded field until the golden harvest yield. The corn that makes the holy bread by which the soul of man is fed. The holy bread, the food on Christ, thy everlasting mercy, Christ. Amen. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
please bow your heads as we pray for God's blessing. May God bless you in winter and summer at your plowing, your sowing, and your reaping. May God give you sunshine and rain in due season. May God, who gladdens the face of the earth, give you joyfulness of heart. May God, who has called you to work on the land, set his affections upon you. And may the blessing of the Trinity, three persons and one God, remain with you and all those for whom you have prayed this day and always. Amen. Tend the earth, care for God's creation, and bring forth the fruits of righteousness. Go in the peace of Christ. There is a very warm welcome for those of you who are able to stay for refreshments in the refectory. If you make your way to the back of the cathedral and through the door at the far side, at that side, and keep going in a straight line through the arch and turn right and you'll find yourself in the refectory. Thank you. 